purpose of this study is as is evident in only the King James Version of the Bible to differentiate the differentiation that is made in the King James Version of the Bible are the distinction between the terms the Holy Ghost Amen in the Holy Spirit uh, I'm going to pause for a minute Brother Conrad I'm getting feedback uh, so maybe we need to turn one of these off let me know before I start uh, testing 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 okay the distinction and there is a and King James is the is a translation or the presentation to the Gentiles the English speaking countries that gives it the differentiation you don't find that differentiation in any other Bible the superlative Bible of Christian Christendom today seems to be the NIV Bible the new international version but I believe personally that the inspired Bible from God to English speaking countries although there are some flaws in it but less than any other uh, is the King James Version of the Bible has been given by God to us English speaking countries for a number of reasons but let's go forward with uh, the um, this lesson. I'm going to turn. I'm, I'm going to turn this off. The first slide is for with stammering lips, and another tongue will he speak to his people. Isaiah chapter 28, and then lets us know when speaking of the stammering lips and another tongue, which is what I love. He says, uh, "This is the rest, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. That is Jesus in you." And this is the refreshing, and yet people won't hear that. So the rest also is not an it, but a who. And that who is Jesus, who says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, because I'm the rest, and I will give you that rest, the rest. And the evidence that you are his son, and that you are a son, is when the rest arrives with the arrival in the presence of the Holy Ghost and of course we're saying that the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Son which we have gone into in the previous weeks uh, which is what Galatians 4 and 6 says and because you are sons I thought the Lord was sending the Holy Ghost it says God has sent forth the Spirit of the Son because the Spirit of the Son is the Holy Ghost and it's the Spirit of the Son is coming into your hearts and there's going to be the announcement of its arrival which is a cry called Abba Father which is what we and was seen on the day of Pentecost the sound that always uh, is there when the Spirit of the Son aka the Holy Ghost enters called speaking in tongues so the Holy Spirit is everything that makes God God the Holy Spirit is the totality of all that the invisible all power of God is. He's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. And you can compress God all you want if you could compress him, but you can't put all of him in any one anything because he fills all things. And so the term, the Holy Spirit, is God. It's all that God is. In him we move, we breathe, we have our being. There's no such thing as outside of him and anything that exists, exists in him. In him we move, breathe, and have our being. The earth is in him. God even sent Nathan to tell David, how are you going to build me a house on the earth? And I'm the maker of the earth. The earth and the moon is in him. The earth, moon, and the sun is in him. The earth, moon, and the solar system is in him. The earth, moon, and the universe, the, the, the galaxy is in him. The earth, moon, the universe, uh, the galaxy, and the universe, and all that is, is in him. You can't compact God down and put him in a six-foot frame. So the Holy Spirit is the totality of what God is. The Holy Ghost is that portion of the Holy Spirit, then called the Spirit of the Son, who after rising from the dead is now present in the believer. Amen. So the Holy Ghost 
is that portion of the Holy Spirit called the Spirit of the Son, who after rising from the dead is now present in the believer, which we'll go further into. But getting back to the rest, there is no rest apart from the Spirit that was in Jesus being in you. There is no rest. That's what men long for and can't find it until they receive the rest that Jesus is. And this is because, this rest comes because the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of the Son in you called the Holy Ghost, is resident in you. Then you have that rest. Only as the Holy Ghost can the Spirit of the Son dwell in you. The Spirit of the Son in you. The Spirit of God in Jesus is called the Spirit of the Son. The Spirit of the Son in you is called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost empowers those who yield to him. Empowers those who yield to him, making them able to overcome all things that are not like God because the purpose of the Holy Ghost, amen, is uh, to transform you uh, into the Son. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Believe me, it's true. Greater is he that is in you, remaking you, than he that's in the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. That is, if you let the Holy Ghost direct you, direct your path. And the scripture says you got to, the Holy Ghost doesn't drive you, it doesn't twist your arm, it doesn't put handcuffs on you. It comes to lead you. He's the shepherd. Shepherd leads sheep, not drive them. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they won't sin. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are called the sons of God. And that interesting? The Spirit of God in Jesus is called the Son of God, made Jesus the Son of God. And the Spirit of Jesus in us makes us also the sons of God. If you have the Holy Ghost, all habits can be defeated, or else the Holy Ghost does not have all power. So if you have the Holy Ghost, there's nothing that you have resident in you that cannot be defeated. Then why, if you have the Holy Ghost, uh, there are things that you say you can't change from? If you have the Holy Ghost and you're not breaking those habits, don't put it on the Holy Ghost. It's because you like what you're doing and you may as well be real about it. Because if you let the Holy Ghost ye lead you and you yield to the Holy Ghost, the things you used to do, you won't do anymore. And if you're doing the things that's are, that are in your flesh and you have the Holy Ghost and you're doing the things that are in your flesh, there is no weakness in the Holy Ghost is that you won't let the Holy Ghost lead you. You're the problem and not the Holy Ghost. Since we can't see the portion of the Spirit of the Son, and if you remember, we talked in previous studies that uh, all of the Spirit that was in the Son cannot be in us because our bodies cannot contain it. Uh, but a portion of the Spirit of the Son is in us, and that portion of the Spirit of the Son in us is called the Holy Ghost. Since we can't see the portion of the Spirit of the Son, how do we know when he has arrived. That answer, Jesus told Jer the disciples, go to Jerusalem and you'll find out how you know when it will arrive. That answer came 10 days after the apostles entered the upper room in Jerusalem. Because when the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting Tongues of fire came and set upon them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. When the Spirit of the Son comes in, it will cry, Abba, Father. How do we know when the invisible Spirit of the Son enters us? How did they know when they received the Holy Ghost? They began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gives them the utterance. So it was the Holy Ghost announcing his arrival by their speaking in tongues. And... As the natural birth, so also is the spiritual birth. That's where we left off last week. In the natural birth, every woman knows there's blood. Every doctor knows there's blood. 
there's water in a natural birth, and there's also a cry. We seem to minimize the cry in the natural birth, but it's still there. It's still needed, rather. In the spiritual birth, likewise, there's blood. The name of Jesus brings on the blood. There's the water that we are to be baptized in. And then there is the cry, the sign that the rest, the Holy Ghost, the measure of the Spirit of the Son in us, has arrived. The natural birth, the physician in the natural birth, the physician is not satisfied until the physician hear that baby cry. That baby have come through the water. That baby has come through the blood. But the doctor is not satisfied until the doctor hear that baby cry. The spiritual birth, likewise, uh, you've come through the waters, you've come through the blood. Uh, the church is to not be satisfied until we hear that born again baby cry because it is significant because the change maker has stepped inside of them to change them, to transform them and, that, and when he, the Holy Ghost, arrives uh, there is to be a cry. Therefore, when the Spirit of the Son enters the believer, the Spirit of the Son in the believer is called the Holy Ghost. And I want to make an impact on that statement. The Holy Ghost exists only in the believer. Out of the believer is not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Son in you. Amen that portion of the Spirit of God that was in, the, that portion of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is called the Spirit of the Son. And that portion of the Spirit of the Son in you is called the Holy Ghost. Besides giving power, speaking in tongues gives an additional benefit. So besides giving power, speaking in tongues give the additional benefit of you surrendering your tongue so that the Spirit can petition himself on your behalf or speak prophetically in your life. Paul talks in Corinthians about in speaking, your speaking in tongues in the absence of an interpreter, you're edifying yourself. So speaking in tongues is God using your tongue to speak prophetically into your life and using your tongue to petition himself on your behalf because we know not how to ask as we ought and sometimes because we don't know how to ask the Holy Ghost we'll go off speaking in tongues grunting and groaning and crying and speaking in tongues we don't know what we're saying and the Holy Ghost is saying I'm going to ask me what you really need for you that is what the strangers in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost testified concerning when the apostles were speaking in tongues, they said, we hear every man speaking in our tongues where we, we were born. And in that upper room, those 120 were speaking in Parthian and Mede, in the language of the Medes and the Elamites and the Mesopotamians, speaking in the tongues of those from Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, throughout all the countries of Asia, uh, Persia, Pamphylia, they were speaking Egyptian, <laughs> they were speaking Libyan, Cyrene, Ju uh, 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 Latin, Amen. The language of the Jews and every other proselyte that was there, they were speaking Crete and Arabian, all while they were speaking in tongues. And all that were there were saying, we hear them speaking in our language. And what were they doing? They were speaking, the interpretation they were hearing was, the, the Holy Ghost was speaking about the wonderful works of God. Exactly what Jesus said. The Holy Ghost is not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk about Jesus. Talking about the wonderful works of God. So besides being a sign, speaking in tongues speaks about the wonderful works of God. Thus fulfilling the words of Jesus, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. John chapter 15, verse number 26. All of God. So let's take a look at that Holy Ghost, that whole, the, the Spirit of the Son as much as the physical body of Jesus could hold was in the body of Jesus. So was all of God in Jesus? No. 
but all of God as much as could be compacted. Uh, you get, a, get one of those trash compactors and just pack it in. As much of God as could fit in, if, let's say he was six foot two. You can't compress God down to a six foot two body. But as much of God as could get in that physical body, that body could hold, was in the body of Jesus. And the scriptures articulated that perfectly, better than I have just said it in Colossians 2 verse 9. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, as much as the body could contain. For in him dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Does everybody understand me? All of God can't get in him. Amen. All of God can't get in nature. <laughs> can't get in the universe. Can't get into creation. Amen. He's bigger than creation. But as much of God as could dwell in the body of Jesus. And the, the scripture says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. To what degree? Assistant senior deacon. As much as he could contain bodily. Everything else just spilled out. That body contained the full measure of the Holy Spirit that it could contain. Does everybody understand how I said that? Amen. That body contained as much of the Holy Spirit, who is God, that the body could contain. For he in whom God has sent speaketh the word of God. Look at this. God did not measure his spirit in him. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. He put as much of God in him as that body could hold, from feet to head, from left hand to right hand. He put into that body, he didn't measure it out to Jesus. He put as much in it as could be in it. Amen. I like it like this. Uh, this is my hand. This is, this is my hand. This is me. <laughs> this is all of me. And uh, as much of me as I can get in my hand is in my hand. Did somebody follow me? Amen. So as much of me as I can get in my hand, is my hand still me? Yes, because as much of me, that's why Jesus is still God. As much of me as I can get in my hand is, uh, is, is, in, my, is in my hand. And so the same thing was true concerning Jesus. He's still God. Because if you pull one cell out of my hand and pull one cell out of the rest of my body, they're all identical. It's still me. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. We, however, will only receive a measure of the spirit of the Son in us. God put in the body of Jesus as much of the Holy Spirit as could be in Jesus. And that portion that was, that portion of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus it was not all God, but as much of God as could be in Jesus. That portion of the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, the scriptures call it the Spirit of the Son. And it was given not by measure. We, however, will only receive a measure of the Spirit of the Son in us. We don't receive any of the Holy Spirit in us. But we do receive a measure of the Spirit of the Son in us. And the Spirit of the Son is that that was in that body of flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 11 says, But all these worketh that one and selfsame spirit, dividing unto every man severally as he wills. He gives uh, the senior assistant, senior deacon, the measure for him to empower him to do the work he wants him to do. Yes, sir. Exactly. Exactly. He gives you enough. And you know, the classic example of that uh, assistant senior deacon is uh, he gave one one talent. He gave one two talent. He gave another five talent. The one that had the five doubled it to ten. The one that had the two doubled it to four. And both of them grew 100%. Because two can't double five God wants you to do with the measure he's given you to do amen and you not being a pastor can't double the pastorate and you being a pastor not a prophet can't double the prophet but 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 work with the measure that he gave you 
and be the best. And let's go even with songster, even with songster. Amen. He wants you to double that. And so he, he give, but he gives to every man severally as he will. Amen. And that's why I told someone, I said, um, there, are there, are, there are those, listen, there are those in Bethlehem Temple that will only give 30%. I wish they would give 40%. But I found out all they want to give is 30%. If I press for 40%, they're going to get mad. So I want the Lord to reveal to me uh, what they're going to give. And they could give more, but that's all they want to give. You follow what I'm saying? So I'm only, I'm only going to give you 10%. I'm only going to give 20 And once I know that, if the person is only going to give me 10%, then all I want to do is try to get 100% of that 10%. <laughs> I'm not even going to think about 11 because they wouldn't handle 11. They're getting mad. And if some can give 30%, that's, that's what I do in my latter years. All they said, I can give you 10, but I ain't giving you but three. Okay, I want 100% <laughs> of that three. And so the Spirit divides to every man severally as he will. That portion of the Holy Spirit, let's make sure we see that, because I think this is key, and believe me, you all are the only ones in all of Christendom, I believe, that will see it this way, um, because I'm the only one that I've ever heard teach it. That portion of the Holy Spirit, because we still have folk talking about, I got the Holy Spirit. I mean, if God showed up in your house now and he's a holy God and you're still in a body of sin, you'd, <laughs> you'd melt like butter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That portion of the Holy Spirit, because your sins have called a separation between you and your God, he's not coming here. <laughs> but that portion of the Holy Spirit that was in the body of Christ was called scripturally the Spirit of the Son. You see that in the gospel. I mean, you see that in the, in the epistle. That portion of the Spirit of the Son, the apostles understood that, that portion that came to die for the sins of the world, to be our intermediary, to be our uh, mediator, is, is called the Spirit of the Son. And that portion of the Spirit of Son that's in us is called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost only exists in the believer. Out of the believer is a portion of the Spirit of the Son. In you is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost doesn't exist outside of you. It ex and the Spirit of the Son didn't exist outside of the body of Christ. The Holy Ghost exists only when he's in you. The, 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 the Holy Spirit in the Son is called the Spirit of the Son. The Spirit of the Son in you is called the Holy Ghost. By definition, the difference in the usage of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is that the Holy Ghost is all of God and all that he is, whereas the Holy Ghost, the, the Holy Spirit is all of God and all that he is, whereas the Holy Ghost is that portion of the Spirit that was in the Son in you. Does everybody follow that? Amen. As a portion of the Holy Spirit was in the body of Christ called the Spirit of the Son, so also is there a measure of the Spirit of the Son in us, still in a body, still in the body of Christ, which is the church. And we're called the sons of God the same reason that that body is called, was called the Son of God, because the Son of God is the Spirit of God in that body. And we're also called Christ. We're also called Jesus, of whom all heaven and earth is named. Because we have the Spirit of the Son in us. That makes us the Son of God. Now ye are the body of Christ. There you go. That's it. There it is. Ye are, so we, we're, the, we're Christ. <laughs> we're the Christ of this world. Amen. We are Christ. You know what Christ means is anointed? Among the... Oh Lord, I'm getting in trouble now. Among the angels, Lucifer was Christ. And the Bible says in Isaiah, he, is the, he was the anointed cherub that covereth. Now, if you took that word anointed and put it in Hebrew, what do you have? Mashiach. That's why even though he failed in the task that God has given him, he still reserved respect until the judgment comes. That's when, when God chastised him. 
in Isaiah chapter 5, he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't slap him, <laughs> knee him, shoot him. He still deserves respect. Touch not my anointed, Mashiach. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. When Michael went to contend for the body of Moses after he died according to Jude, Michael stood up to Satan but said, the Lord rebuke you. That's all you're supposed to do. I'm giving you a little gem right now. And therefore, following that pattern, if Satan was a peer, the Bible didn't say club him. It said resist the devil. You just say the Lord rebuke you and let him do the running. And we got folk in church now saying I'm dancing all on him. I'm kicking him in the head. You're in trouble with God when you do things like that. But you are the body of Christ and members in particular. That's the point that I wanted. And that's called the church also. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. The Holy Ghost, Lord have mercy. He's not in Israel. He's not in the world. Uh, he's not in France. He's not in America. The Holy Ghost is only for the church. That's how the bride is so special. He, that's what it should be. He can only dwell in the body of Christ. The Spirit of the Son could only dwell, the Holy Spirit could only dwell in the body of Christ. When Jesus was here, you didn't see him, at, you didn't see the Holy Spirit anywhere else but in the body of Christ, in the body of Christ that was called the Spirit of the Son. And so the Spirit of the Son in us is called the Holy Ghost, and, and He can only dwell in the body of Christ, which is the church. Ye are the body of Christ. And the Holy Ghost can dwell nowhere else. If you want the Holy Ghost, guess where you got to come? To the church. And once in the church you get the Spirit of the Son in you called the Holy Ghost, then you become the Son of God. The same as that body came out of Mary's womb, once that body had the, the Holy Spirit in it, in that body, the yes, it, in that body, uh, Gabriel said, that combination would have a name, and that name would be the Son of God. That's what it says. And he shall be called the Son of God. God speaks in the, so, so now, God today speaks in the church Today, only when the Holy Ghost speaks. So we're getting ready to go into something here now. He speaks in the church today only when the Holy Ghost speaks. He only speaks as the Holy Ghost. God told me, there's no more, there's no more of that. I hope somebody hear what I'm getting ready to say. There's no more of that in the Old Testament. God spoke as God and Father. We're going to see that in the slides coming. For 33 and a half years, God spoke as Jesus and the Son of God. And in the, that's the Father in the Old Testament, 33 and a half years in the New Testament, the Son, and now God speaks to the church and in the church as the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said that the Holy Ghost would come and, and give you, well, let's go. As the Son, he spoke through his body of flesh in the language of his day. As the Father, he spoke through the prophets. Old Testament, as the Son, he spoke through his body of flesh in the language of his day. As the Holy Ghost, he speaks through the church in what's called speaking in tongues. So when the Holy Ghost speaks and wants to say something to the church, my brothers, everything else we get, we get it from the Word of God. Everything else that you want to know comes from the Word of God. That's why it's written. Everything else that you want to know come from the Word of God. But if God want to speak to the church today, He speaks through the church, to the church today as the Holy Ghost. As the Holy Ghost, He speaks through the church, to the church rather, and when He speaks, He can only speak in a language that we don't understand. He speaks in what's called speaking. If you want to hear what God has to say today, you have to hear the Holy Ghost. And if you want to hear what the Holy Ghost has to say, the Holy Ghost only speaks in tongues, not English. You see how important the speaking in tongues was to that day that it said, Paul said, I love speaking in tongues and the church was constantly, because that's the only, we, we're going to see that. 
as the Holy Ghost, he speaks through to the church in what's called speaking in tongues. And because he speaks to the church in what's called speaking in tongues, he has to put another gift in the church, which is called the interpretation of tongues, so you'll know what he's saying. That's why there needs to be an interpreter. Because when God speaks, he, the Holy Ghost preached to the men on the day of Pentecost that were in Jerusalem, but the apostles were speaking in tongues, but they understood the interpretation. And so, when God talks today in the church, we should be saying uh, what the Holy Ghost had to say, but the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost speaks, the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. And I don't know what the Holy Ghost is saying because he only speaks in tongues. So now I need an interpreter, the gift of interpretation to understand what God is saying. In fact, the Holy Ghost predominates the church and is mentioned, uh, uh, it, it was mentioned in Acts over 42 times in the book of Acts. You're not hearing nothing about the Father. You're not hearing nothing about the Son. You're hearing about the Holy Ghost. And in the entire New Testament, the Holy Ghost is doing and acting and speaking over 91 times in the New Testament. That's all you hear. You don't hear a thing about the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. You don't hear a thing about the Holy Ghost for the 33 and a half years that Jesus walked here and tell a lot of portion of his ministry. But when you get to the church, every time you turn around, the Holy Ghost is speaking to the church. And when the Holy Ghost speaks to the church, how is the Holy Ghost speaking? In tongues. And when, when the disciples say, the Holy Ghost said, believe me, there was an interpreter interpreting what somebody was speaking in tongues saying. So the fact is, the Holy Ghost predominant. Well, let's take a look at them. The Holy Ghost rules in the church. Jesus said the same thing. It was confirmed on the day of Pentecost. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verse number 28. When Peter informed Ananias and Sapphira when they lied about a, a vow that they had made, uh, Peter said, you lied to the Holy Ghost. He didn't say to the Father. He didn't say to the Son. He said, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Why Holy Ghost? Because Holy Ghost predominates in the church. When choosing workers for the church, the apostles said, uh, we need to find men that's full of the Holy Ghost. They didn't say the Father. They didn't say the Son. They said, we need to find men full of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is going to give them wisdom and we can appoint them over this business because the Holy Ghost is in charge of the church. If, uh, if Sister Paige is a soloist and that anointing is on her life, it's because of the Holy Ghost. Stephen told the people who it was that they were resisting. He, didn't, he said, you're resisting the Holy Ghost. And your fathers did it also because the Holy Ghost is still God. But the Holy Ghost just cascades through the pages of the New Testament. Ruling in the church, it was the Holy Ghost who chose Barnabas and Saul to be apostles. Uh, uh, it said, as, the, as those that were in that church service were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. How did the Holy Ghost say that? In their language? No. Somebody started speaking in tongues, and someone stood up and said, and, and interpreted the tongues, with the, uh, 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 and it was interpreted saying, uh, thus saith the Holy Ghost. Separate out me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. But it was who? The Holy Ghost. In fact, it was the Holy Ghost who sent them. Because it says after that they were sent by the Holy Ghost. You hear me? I'm saying the Holy Ghost is doing the work. This is the, the superintendent, the chief executive officer in the church age is the Holy Ghost. In you. It was the Holy Ghost who directed the apostles whenever any difficulties came out in controversy that needed resolution. A matter came up, and James declared, here's, here's the solution, and it's the Holy Ghost that said it. It's good, it seems good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than the necessary things. He didn't say the Father, he didn't say the Son. It was the Holy Ghost who stopped Paul from going to Asia in Acts chapter 16. Now when they had gone through uh, to, to, to per, 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 Parisia and the regions of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to go and preach the word in Asia. I'm talking about 91, 92 times in all of the New Testament. 
It was the Holy Ghost who kept Paul in courage. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions are waiting. Every time Paul went to the service, somebody got up speaking in tongues, and an interpreter was letting Paul know that you're going to be arrested. But who was doing in the talking? The Holy Ghost. I'm just giving you some. This is not all of them. Examples in the New Testament. A prophet named Agabus, and he said it was sent by the Holy Ghost to warn Paul of his afflictions that were coming. And when he was coming to us, Agabus, he took Paul's girdle, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus said the Holy Ghost. And you know what was being said in the Old Testament? Thus said the Lord. Thus said the Holy Ghost. The Jews are going to bind the man and take him and give him over to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 20. Does everybody see what I'm saying? The Holy Ghost predominates. Paul makes it clear in the closing chapter of Acts that the book which records, the, the, in the closing chapter of Acts, the book which records the beginnings of the church, that the Holy Ghost is God in the church. This is that last chapter. When the Jews finally rejected Paul, and Paul says, I'm leaving you, and I'm not turning back to the Jews, but going to the Gentiles. And after Paul preached that last sermon to the Jews, he said, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after Paul had spoken one word, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. So Paul is saying the God that was talking to Isaiah was the same as the Holy Ghost is in the church. Saying they won't hear The only way that the Holy Ghost speaks is through speaking in tongues, requiring an interpreter to know what he has spoken. And that's why 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 10 says, if he gives one diverse kinds of tongues, that he's going to give somebody, you know, he gives severally according to his will. To another, he gives the interpretation of tongues. I don't know if everybody understands now where we're heading, because now we're beginning to understand why there's weakness in the church because we won't let the Holy Ghost speak. Why there's weakness in the church? Because we want the Father to speak. <laughs> Why there's weakness in the church? Because we want the Son to speak. The Father is through speaking when he sealed Malachi. The Son is through speaking when he rose from the grave after completing the work that he has to do and now the Holy Ghost is speaking. And, and you know, the classic example of that is this. Is my thumb me? Is my thumb all of me? No. no. You can take one cell in my thumb and find all of me in, my, in that one cell, but that one cell is still not all of me. And that's exactly what you're saying. By just finding my thumb or that one cell, you haven't diluted me. You, you give that to the right uh, 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 a doctor or geneticist, he can tell you I was a male. He can, he can tell you what color my hair was. <laughs> Amen. And that's the way, it's the same thing with Jesus. So let us pray that both speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues return to the church. I'm talking about the real thing. The real thing. And you can't let it get out of control. And if not, today, other than the scriptures, there's no edification to the church. So the Holy Ghost comes to edify. If you're speaking in the tongues in the absence of an interpreter, Paul's saying you edify yourself. You speak in tongues in the presence, and God's, if you speak in tongues and there is no interpreter, you are edifying yourself, and we need edification. But if God wants to edify the church, then somebody's going to speak in tongues and somebody's going to stand up and interpret the tongues and then the whole church is going to be edified to be encouraged. And that happened in the book of Acts many times. When they got in a tight spot, they got to that altar. 
the Holy Ghost got to come in and, and, and it says afterwards they were encouraged. They got up and was ready to go again. One time the persecution was so hard, uh, they were about to throw the towel in. I think it's maybe Acts about 15. I don't know. I can't remember. But, but they had to get together and, 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 and let the Lord, you got to send the Holy Ghost like we got it at the beginning. The first time was on the day of Pentecost. The next time was at Cornelius. And the other time was when they were so despondent over the persecution. The only thing that could keep them going was the Holy Ghost letting them know you can make it. Pardon? Encouraging you. Uh, I'm sorry. For you, you're talking about when it's just you. In the absence of an interpreter. Because the scripture says, because the Holy Ghost is making intercessions for you. And you, you know when you get through speaking, I, I, can I know because I've, I've heard you speaking in tongues. And when you got up, I know you've been edified because you got tears running <laughs> You got tears running down. You waving your hand. That, uh, I'm looking at you. That's not helping me. That's helping you. You feeling good, etc. But if God's got a word for me or the church, then you then you're standing up and edifying, and then there's an interpreter that's saying, Y'all really want to grow Bethlehem Temple? Here's what you need to do. <laughs> I just use that as an example. Amen. No. Amen. Amen. But if he wants you to know, there's going to be an interpreter. Amen. And that's what Paul was talking about because they, the, uh, the, you know, the two things that the, uh, the church loved in that day, they loved speaking in tongues every chance they got, and they loved receiving communion every chance they got. Because they fully understood the impact of communion in terms of healing and health and all those kinds of things. They understood that. Uh, that's why the scripture says, as often as you do it, because they were doing it often. They weren't taking it and hiding it for a year. <laughs> Only one time, the first Sunday in March, or Easter Sunday, or Resurrection Sunday. No, that was something that they looked forward to. Yes. Amen. And so, and, and, and speaking in tongues, I mean, that was their daily bread. Because don't you want to hear what God has to say? So don't you hear what he has to say? And what he has to say is through the Holy Ghost. So there's no edifying. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5, I would that ye all speak with tongues. This is where you were, your question. But rather that ye prophesied. I would that ye all speak in tongues, but better that ye prophesied. That's for you. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret, so that the church can be edified. It's not helping the other 300 because you're being edified. I mean, it's good that you're being edified, but it's not helping the other 300. So, uh, so it's better, it would be better for me just to get up and preach and edify the church in the language they understand than you're speaking in tongues that don't even have an interpreter. But don't reject that because it's good for you. But when it comes to speaking in tongues, if the church wants to be edified, uh, then we need an interpreter. And this is what the issue was. On the, they, 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 the Corinthian church had everybody, every service, they were all speaking in tongues, and nobody's interpreting. So Paul had to write a whole chapter on that and, 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 and blunt that because visitors was coming in, and Paul said, they'll think that you're crazy. They'll think that you're mad. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, so he had to put some limitations on it. So he said to the church, that needs to stop because God is a God of decency and order. So therefore, if there's going to be speaking in tongues, particularly if the unbeliever, I mean, if you just want to speak in tongues and all of us edify ourselves, come to Tuesday service. Come to Friday service. Don't come on Sunday and have 50 people speaking in tongues. Because the world that's here are going to think you're crazy. Those that come from the Catholic, well, they got a ministry called Glossolalia now. Uh, uh, but, but those from other places are going to think you're crazy because they don't understand that. I remember the church that I was in. One lady came in and saw her grown daughter 
uh, Lanny in the middle of the service on that Sunday morning speaking in tongues, she grabbed her daughter and drug that daughter out of the church, screaming, all y'all are crazy, because she didn't understand. So Paul said, we got to put a barometer, we, we, we got to limit that. He, I, I come to, he says, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, then don't go beyond two or maybe three. And th that by course, that means don't all three of you stand up and do, do if you want to do that, come on Tuesday. If you want to do that, come on Friday. But don't come on Sunday. Imagine you going to a church for the first time and, and three, <laughs> three people standing up speaking in tongues. He says, and uh, two at the most, maybe three, and that means one at a time. That by course. And at least have one interpreter when it's done so that the church can be edified. Because the Holy Ghost, God speaks through the Holy Ghost to the church. Amen. If I want to hear what God has to say, I go to the written word. That's what I do. God doesn't talk to me. God don't, uh, God don't talk to me about twice. One day I'll tell you uh, how he spoke. One was when he called me and one was when he encouraged me in a matter that I was concerned about. And in the matter that I was concerned about, I said, uh, if you really want me to do such and such a thing, you wake me up. I'm not even setting my alarm clock. I want you to wake me up. And if you wake me up in time to go do it, then I'll do it. And I was laying in bed, sound asleep, and a voice simply said, Donald Lee. That was all that was said. <laughs> that was the only answer. It was Donald Lee. And nobody calls me Donald Lee. And the, the voice was so addicting, I told somebody, I said, it sounds like many waters. I didn't even know that that was in the Bible. It's in Revelations that his voice sounds like, I said, it sounds like running water. And to this day, I'm still addicted to that that I heard. If it was cocaine, I'd be chasing it. It was just that, it was that wonderful, yes. Amen. And the, uh, when people go running and saying that, you know, the Lord, I'm in the grocery store, and all of a sudden the Lord don't tell me to speak in tongues. Nobody can ever interpret. No. And what am I saying to the grocery store? Thank you. And I'm not going to make myself look crazy, because they will look crazy. And, and Paul, in the same Corinthians, in the same Corinthians chapter 14, he tells you times not to speak in tongues. Exactly. He says you don't speak in tongues when you're blessing your food. He says, you don't speak in tongues when you're preaching. <laughs> he says, well, you don't speak in tongues when you're having, a, I'm having a conversation with you and then I go off speaking in tongues and come back to the conversation. What the, what was that all about? So he gives, he gives, God is so precious that he just doesn't want you to misuse him. And there are those that's misusing the tongues. And those, there are those that are, um, are out of order, and that's what was happening in the church. So Paul was setting the, he was setting the conditions. You can't do that. But there's a day that we can do it. When all of us who understand the Holy Ghost all get together, we can run through troops and leap over walls, and all 100 of us can be speaking in tongues, and nobody think we're crazy. But don't do it on Sunday. Don't do it at the, uh, at the Civic Center meeting. Don't do it at Compassion Break. <laughs> Somebody's, don't do it while you're blessed. Don't do it when you're up here preaching and then you go off speaking in tongues and come back to preaching. What? They, nobody knows what you said. That didn't help no, but that didn't help anybody. It was just helping you to collect your thoughts because you were speaking faster than you were thinking. So verse 27 says, and if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And in that same chapter, uh, Sister Page, he said, doing it out of order, the world's going to think that you're mad. And the first time I went to a, a holiness church at a funeral as a young kid, I thought they were mad. I ran out of there. I didn't even stay to see the body. And we were finished. And then and only then, as Jesus said, and has been shown in the first century church, will the words of Jesus be fulfilled that the Holy Ghost comes to lead us and guide us as it did the apostles.
The Holy Ghost led all through the book of Acts, telling Paul where to go, how to go, what to do, encouraging, speaking, etc., in tongues with an interpreter. And so when the Holy Ghost, if we want God to speak to the church, it's got to be through somebody speaking in tongues and an interpreter interpreting what they're saying. If I want to hear what the Father has to say, I got to go to that Bible. And then think about this. Why would God go through 6,000 years of human history, with, through the prophets, etc., to write his word down if afterwards he's going to tell everybody everything? What was the sense in writing it? Or let's go further. Let's go further. And, I, and there are those that just want to be so prophetic that and God to speak to them that they won't accept it anyway. But why would God make, call me to be a pastor over Bethlehem Temple and then have people coming into my office saying, this is what God told me. Why did he need me? <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that logical? Then why would he need me? And I abide it when there are those that come into my office and say what it is that they, they, want, they want to say. They, they just want to, um, uh, for, for some reason, they got the need to be chosen of God for God to speak through them. I'm a pastor of a church, and I just told you. I'm 71 going on 72, and I, or, or, or 72 going on 72, 71, one of them. <laughs> and and uh, I just told you, in my entire life, God has not spoken to me but twice. Every other time, every message that I get is from reading the Word. Or else, why do we need the word if he's going to be doing the talk? Then they say, well, they, he spoke to the prophets so they could write the word. There was no word, so they were pinning the word. And so today we are in what's called the silence of God. And there are, period, there are periods where God is silent. And I'm telling you, uh, my brothers and sisters, you can read it for yourself. God always was silent and did not speak Whenever history turned to the land of the Gentiles, he only, speak, he only spoke among the Jews. Read the book of Esther. Esther is in the land of the Gentiles. You don't find God saying nothing. It's called the silences of God. He only speaks to the Jews demonstratively. It is after the church is raptured in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. It's after the church is raptured that all of a sudden, miracles and demonstrations by God show back up in the earth. Now, I appreciate God's silence because I get a better reward. Why does he have to speak to the Jews but won't speak to the Gentiles? Because the Jews will only believe by sight. The Gentiles by faith. And those that believe by faith gets better. As soon as he went into the room, he told Thomas, yeah, you, you're a Jew. So come and touch me. <laughs> you, know why, you know why the nails are in his hand? If Jesus, <clears throat> if Jesus were to appear to you, which he's not, but if he were to appear to you, he wouldn't appear with nail prints in his hands because you're supposed to believe by faith. The nail prints are in his hands for those that don't believe so that they'll say, well, he's the Messiah. That's why in Zechariah, when he appears, the Bible is going to say that they're going to call him the Messiah and then be stunned when they see the nail prints in his hands. Because that without the nail prints, Jesus is not the Messiah as far as the Jew is concerned. So he only speaks, he it's called the silences of God. He's silent in the, when, whenever history shifts to the Gentiles and shifts out of Israel. You don't hear God talking except through his word. Now, isn't that what he's always, say, always saying, let's go to the word? Amen. And I just think it's a very anomaly and a very insane God or, or um, uh, 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 a God that has a split personality that would have put a pastor in a church, but then talked to the members. <laughs> and, and that just makes, it just, it makes common sense. And so in the church, uh, to simply put it, the father, God as in the office of father, had his day to do what he did as father. That's the establishment 
of the Old Testament, speaking through the prophets in Israel, etc. Then he spoke as the Son, or through the office of the Son, when he came to earth in the flesh. And now he speaks as the Holy Ghost in the church. And so it's the Holy Ghost that speaks to the church, and that's what Jesus told his, um, his disciples and his followers. And the Holy Ghost exists, and these are things that only you know. Other than, and, and I'm mad, they said. The Holy Ghost, there is no such thing as the Holy Ghost out of you. The Holy Ghost only exists when the Spirit of the Son is in you, is called the Holy Ghost. There's no Spirit of the Son outside of the body that Jesus was in. It is, it's called the, the Spirit is called the Spirit of the Son in the body that Jesus was in, and the Spirit of the Son is called the Holy Ghost in His other body, which is us. And so that's the reason why I believe, only in the King James Version, that there's a differentiation between Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit. Everywhere else you go, you got them saying the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. If, if God showed up in this room right now as horrific as sin is to him, we would all fall down dead. Amen. So he had to find another way to save us, and he put in Jesus as much of him as could be in Jesus. And it was only that portion of him that was in Jesus that went to die for us, not all of God. Only that portion. And the example that I use is if, if that portion of God that was in Jesus is the thumb, then, then, then that would be like... Uh, this is my thumb. But this my, although it's called the thumb, to differentiate it from all of me, isn't it still all of me? It's still all of me. Because uh, it's still a part of me, but the only me that's in the thumb, thumb is as much of me as can get in the thumb. And so once we understand that, we understand what the Word of God has to say, but the purpose of this series was to show the differentiation between the definition of Holy Spirit, amen, and Holy Ghost. Even King James was wise enough that when Jesus died on the cross, Sister Heard, he said, and he gave up the ghost. What does that mean? That part that was in him was called the ghost, and it's only that part that was in him that's going to be in us. And once it's in us, by measure, it's called the Holy Ghost, amen? All right, that concludes this series. Let the church say amen. I hope that this was in informative. Amen. I taught something once, and someone called another church and told them what I had said, and uh, the pastor had said that I have gone uh, against all of the scriptures. He passed uh, Hawkins Bell had to tell me, they say that you don't believe in the blood of Jesus anymore. <laughs> I said, Lord, have mercy. Amen. And someone said, another pastor called me and said, you taught a, a Bible study where you said that, uh, uh, that men, are, uh, that, the, that the saints are gods. <laughs> but what's going to happen, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to go and tell pastor said Z, well, you're the one that heard A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. You, you heard all of that that got to the Z, and you just went and put the Z out there. And, and maybe if you left the, if you left the, uh, if you left the Z alone and went through, well, I'll say it the way that Bishop Paddock said. Someone asked him a question, and I and I learned from that. Someone asked Bishop Paddock a question, and Bishop Paddock said in the minister's class, he said, "Brother, I can't answer that question because it's going to take at least eight Bible studies before I can get to give you the answer. <laughs> because just to say an answer." Uh, would make the person think that you are mad, and they should think you're mad if you don't lay the foundation first. All right, let us all stand. Amen. Let us all.